Hello and a warm welcome from Kampala. It is nice to have you with us for this new edition of Eco Africa, the environmental show brought to you by DW in Germany, Nigeria's Channels TV and NTV right here in Uganda. My name is Sandra Twinovio and with me is my co-host from Nigeria. Yes, hi there. I am Chris Elems in Ogun State. And as always, we have a lot of interesting reports lined up for you today, including one about fancy e-bikes from Uganda. Also on the show, why eating insects is good for the environment. How environmental activists in Spain want to eliminate plastic from the Mediterranean. And how to make farming more eco-friendly, thanks to an app in Nigeria. Let's start right here in Uganda. Ginger District wants to become the first e-bike city in all of Africa. And what are called Afri cruisers are already rolling through the city. Developed in Europe and India, they are intended to make transporting goods easier and, of course, ensure that traffic in the region becomes more sustainable. We'll take you now on a ride. Every morning, his two youngest children are his first passengers. Walter Onem is a bike taxi driver in the city of Jinja, some 90 kilometers east of the Ugandan capital of Kampala. A few months ago, he traded in his old bike taxi for an Afri Cruzi, an e-bike developed for the African market. His passengers are thrilled. Then we at least, you can see somebody say, now nah, let me go to e -bit. let me go with this one, because they are using power and not using manpower, so it attracts the customer. Afri Kruzi was the brainchild of Eugen Persson, a teacher from northern Germany. More than 10 years ago, as he was traveling across Africa, he began thinking about how transportation on the continent could become more sustainable. Many people rode motorbikes, which are expensive and high emissions, and he realized something else too. Africa has lots of solar energy units and huge mobility and in Europa needs. So viele Europe e has lots of e-bikes. So why not combine e-bikes with e Africa's solar energy, energy to make a cargo bike? That could really help solve mobility problems on the continent. To help make his idea a reality, he brought an e-bike specialist from Germany on board. Together, they designed the first prototype and realized the e-bikes would need to be adapted to the needs of African customers, including the local road conditions. That was a pretty big challenge when it came to designing the bike. The conditions of the roads aren't necessarily like what e-bike riders are used to here. And some of the bike components that the industry tends to rely on might not be available in general. More spokes in the wheels and a reinforced frame styled in the look of a more expensive motorbike. The Afri Cruzi was designed to be robust and appeal to its clientele, and at 600 euros, it's quite a bit more affordable than most e-bikes. And the plan also called for microcredits to help finance the purchase. Passion's partner in Berlin is part of Hero Cycles, the world's largest bicycle manufacturer. It's based in India. Thanks to its size and low labor costs, Hero can produce the Afri Cruises more affordably and draw on cross-financing with other product lines. For Hero, it's an idea that makes sense Africa could become a major market. Whether it's e-bike taxis, e-bike ambulances, or water delivery bikes, the first 100 Afri cruises went into operation in Uganda a few months ago. At Fabio, the NGO based in Jinja that's coordinating the Afri Cruzi project. The first batch of e-bikes already attracted a lot of interest. In Uganda, energy prices have been rising for weeks. That's also helping to make e-mobility more appealing. This comes as an alternative, as a transport or mobility alternative that people can use instead of motorized transport like cars, like motorcycles. The fact that it is functional, it is able to carry 100 kilograms of, of cargo, so it is functional, it is very fast, it is uh, of course fancy. 
Fabio runs small service points to handle maintenance and to swap out the solar batteries. Mechanic Joshua Mugaya joined the project early on and now has a permanent position. He tries to save as much of his paycheck as possible. I want to start up a workshop and I want to skill my fellow friends and younger people down there. I want to skill them on how to repair bikes, on how to repair e-bikes. Walter Onin also comes here to swap batteries. When business is brisk, he's here twice a day. On days when he can't make it, he's out of luck. So only challenge is one thing, maybe if the battery is not there, so you cannot ride using night because there's no light. So you have to stop during the day. The Fabio team also stay in regular contact with technical designers in Berlin. Should the bicycle lights get a separate battery? Does the frame need any updates? The two teams are working on refining the next generation of Afri cruises. The next 640 e-bikes are about to go into production in India. They will be headed to Togo, Benin, Burkina Faso, Tanzania and other countries. Soon, a few components are slated to be produced in Uganda. Jürgen Persson is happy that his Afri Cruise project is taking off. And for Walter Onen and his family, the e-bikes have made their day-to-day -day lives that much easier. Whoa, that is super great. I would definitely love to take a ride. Students from Rabat in Morocco have built a car that is powered only by solar energy. It is an unusual project for the country and the team behind it has even set their goals on international competitions. So let's check out this week's Doing a Bit. It's time to hit the road. At speeds of up to 120 kilometers an hour in a car powered by the sun. This solar race car was designed by 16 engineering students in Morocco. Their goal is to develop technologies that one day could be used in ordinary cars and eliminate their climate killing emissions. The idea came up in the context of expanding our use of renewable energy, especially now that our country has decided to go green in many areas. The project allowed us to put our theoretical knowledge into practice. The team is now optimizing their second prototype, the Eliodora 2, which means gift of the sun in Greek. The team from Rabat spent nearly 2,000 hours working on the vehicle. The chassis is made of lightweight carbon fibre. Its batteries and telemetry system have also been improved. This is the first invention of its kind in North Africa, and it meets solar power standards. We've collaborated with companies that provided funding, and now we're hoping to bring others on board to help complete this project and maybe launch a new one. But first, they plan to enter Eliodora 2 in some major international competitions. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. What a great idea. Changing the topic now, feeding the growing population worldwide is such a difficult task. Box may be the answer. Pioneers all over the world are developing sustainable product made from the larvae of black soldier flies. In Germany, it seems there is just one sticking point standing in the way of success. Governmental red tape. It could be so easy. Breeding harmless little flies to lay eggs, which turn into maggots with a voracious appetite for food waste and the larvae can be turned into tasty high-protein burgers. Good for the climate and the environment, though it's not quite that straightforward yet. But first things first. Welcome to the love shack of the black soldier fly, a creature by the name Hermetia elucans. 
Heinrich Katz is a superstar among fly farmers. He'd love to expand his farm and be part of the insect protein revolution. And the larvae are up to the job. They have a voracious appetite and gobble up everything from food waste to animal excrement. In true Latin fashion, their body weight increases 6,000-fold in just three weeks. The problem is, EU regulations forbid the farmer from feeding them food waste. If you're a pioneer doing something new, you're going to really enjoy what you're doing and be enthusiastic about it. But often you do bump into challenges, especially in the case of disruptive innovation. You might find yourself facing regulatory hurdles. This is why they're currently fed on pig feed. This up here is okara, which is great for our young larvae. Okara is a byproduct of tofu production. But there are more efficient solutions available, like in Kenya, where Heinrich Katz has also set up a fly farm. With indoor plumbing a rarity in many poorer districts, a startup has set up portable lavatories in selected places. The excrement is later collected and mixed with food waste, a blend that's perfectly suited to the black soldier fly larvae. The larvae are then fed to pigs and chickens. We've had this system up and running for a couple of years now with zero problems and no cases of animals getting sick. Before waste can be used this way, the EU wants proof that it's a safe product. We know that we need to deliver empirical evidence that it's safe. But the EU is basically making that impossible because they won't grant us an exemption. So we're being asked to provide evidence while being denied the means to do so. We can only hope that we'll be granted exemptions at the local level and that the EU doesn't put a spanner in the works. For now, Heinrich Hans's ground fly larvae can only be fed to dogs and fish. But if all goes well, larvae could be the next big thing in the food industry. We now have a look at farming, which has a reputation for being a lot of hard work. But you don't have to do all the work yourself. Why not invest in eco-friendly farming? A woman in Nigeria came up with a brilliant idea. See for yourself. Agriculture is a big business in Nigeria. Whether you're plucking peppers or harvesting tomatoes, there's something for everyone's table and taste. But farming is also cool and becoming tech savvy. Now, you can even manage acres of land using nothing but your mobile phone. And Rebecca Amou is the brains behind the operation. Initially, our focus was just to curb hunger and ensure people could afford their basic needs for their home. But currently, we have all class of people wanting to be a part of the Farm From Your Phone program. Currently, we have over 10,000 subscribers. Rebecca is actually a computer science graduate. She wanted to find a technological solution to farming inefficiencies after seeing her mother and other farmers battle for many years. She originally founded Ray and Mo Farms in 2016 to solve the post-harvest waste problem. But during COVID, she witnessed many Nigerians struggling to buy food. The Farm From Your Phone program was launched during the first outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. It was created to spur um, youth interest in agriculture and to also create empowerment for the masses, especially the youth, and ensuring that they earn residual income from the comfort of their funds. Rebecca co-founded the Africa Wealth Initiative with other young professionals to create the program that allows everyone to participate in farming and reap the benefits. I put in because my money can actually work for me, having a reliable team do something and I get benefit out of it, which was lovely. I subscribed to Farm From Your Phone because it is actually a side hustle for me. I can easily farm on my phone instead of going to farm to run things and then it's I'm getting my income on it, and so it's so beneficial. The market for remote farming is booming, and Rebecca is making sure that quality control is her top priority. For instance, she and her team are keeping the use of pesticides to a minimum. We carry out um, soil analysis, water analysis, we study prevalence, pests, 
around and the climate um, and the climate condition of the place that helps us understand the balance that exists in that environment already so that help shows us and mirror the kind of um, organic process to follow to both um, reduce the attack of pests and to increase productivity and that's how you go farm to market in the 21st century rebecca and her team have made it easier than ever to become a farmer with a swipe of your finger instead of a sickle our next report takes us to the Mediterranean. The sea of the coast of southern Europe and northern Africa is littered with plastic and other debris. That's bad for tourism, but above all, it's bad for marine life. In Spain, volunteer divers are helping with cleanup efforts. Short snouted seahorses, soft corals, Neptune grass, gropers, and a wide variety of seaweed inhabit the Mediterranean waters of Murcia in southeastern Spain. With 73 kilometers of coast and the biggest saltwater lagoon in Europe, it's a paradise for recreational fishing. But many fishermen use lead sinkers. They can end up on the seabed, where they pose a threat to marine life. Let's take the case of a fish feeding on an algae growing on a piece of lead. When that fish approaches and begins eating the algae, it also ingests the lead. It becomes part of the marine food chain, the small fish being eaten by the bigger fish and so on. The lead is passed from one to the other until finally we, as seafood consumers, wind up with that lead on our plate. Some fishers are starting to use alternative sinkers made of ceramic or zinc. But the UN estimates some 640,000 tons of fishing gear, including hazardous metals, still ends up in our oceans each year. To combat the problem, volunteers from Hippocampus, an organization focused on the conservation of short-snouted seahorses, have launched the Plum Boom Project. Plum Boom is an idea Plum Boom is a project born after so many dives, where we saw so much rubbish made from metal, from lead used in sport fishing and professional fishing. Nets loaded with lead sinkers, for example. To remove the metals from the sea, the project relies on a vast network of volunteer divers, like Felix Arias Herans. Today, he's joining a cleaning expedition at Cabo de Palos, a seaside village in one of the most biodiverse areas in the Mediterranean basin. We're going to collect lead from the sea floor, mainly marine waves and hooks from fishing gear, small pieces that settle on the bottom and get half buried. Let's see if we get lucky. With the help of metal detectors, divers can collect between 4 and 45 kilos of lead at each cleaning. The results are registered on a website that monitors their efforts. Since 2017, more than 14,000 metal sinkers, equivalent to one ton of lead, have been removed from the Mediterranean. But Plum Boom doesn't just remove the metal, it also contributes to the circular economy by giving it a second life. Thanks to public funds and private contributions, 200 containers have been distributed at diving centers and yacht clubs along the coast. Here, all divers can deposit pieces they've salvaged. We put the lead here. Then the association collects it and takes it to the companies we have an agreement with. They can recycle the metal so it can be used again in batteries, for example. Once the containers are full, the project coordinators bring them back to the Heavy Metals Recovery Center. To date, they've delivered more than 900 kilos for recycling. Apart from lead, other garbage, such as plastic, cans, and glass, is harming the marine ecosystem. Normally, only divers see the damage firsthand. 
So Plumbu members also organize photo exhibitions to raise awareness and reveal the underwater reality. El que no bucea, no sabe. People who don't dive can imagine what is underwater, but they don't really know. So if we show them photos and explain to them the consequences of having garbage in the sea, they become more aware. In addition to encouraging the use of sustainable sinkers, Plumbum is working with governments to implement eco-friendly marine policies. And it's appealing to all people to stop throwing trash into the sea. Wow, what a great project. Without them, the Mediterranean would be in a much worse shape. And think of the birds that pick litter out of the sea. All that waste poses such a danger to them. Yes, birds, especially the sea birds, need better protection. Cape Verde is home to one of the main breeding sites of the red billed tropical bird in West Africa. But their habitat is under threat. The marvelous red-billed tropic bird. These migratory birds spend most of their lives at sea, flying thousands of kilometers across the Atlantic and only coming to land to breed. High up in the rocks, they find holes to make their nests. But not much else is known about their habits. Researchers from Cape Verde have only recently found one of the largest colonies in the world, here on the island of Sal. Artua Lopez is a field technician with Project Biodiversity, a local organization trying to learn more about the species to help save the birds from threats linked to growing tourism. They monitor more than 500 nests on the island. They are beautiful. They have like a big tail and they have like a, it's like a woman when they want to go out, like a, you pay the leaves and they pin the eyes. Super nice. Today they're out tagging and taking samples from the birds. They've found an unwilling participant here in the side of the cliff. The bird goes into a bag to help calm it down. First, they'll take blood to determine its sex. It's like a we take it from the feet. You can see like the vein is coming from there to here. We clean it first and after we take it. It's a baby. The samples they collect help them understand more about the bird's habits, diet, and migration patterns, as well as contaminants they've consumed. That also shows how the health of their environments is changing. Feathers also provide some clues. It's like to change it, to check like when, when is the, the time of the year, like they change the feather, and to check like if they're feeding well and so. Toxins build up in the feathers, evidence of how many pollutants the birds are ingesting and therefore indicative of the health of fish populations and our oceans. Of course, there's also another way to find out what they've been eating. <laughs> After returning the bird home safely, it's time to check on other nests. This baby is just two weeks old, the only chick his parents will have this season. That makes the population especially vulnerable, and red-billed tropic birds are up against an increasingly dangerous world. Not far from their nests, tourists soak up the sun and sand. Construction along the coast erodes natural habitats, and light pollution disorients the seabirds during the night. Introduced species like stray dogs prey on the birds. Not to mention plastic pollution, which gets into their diet through microplastics in the fish they eat. But it's a balancing act. Tourism means more economic opportunities for locals on the island. But Project Biodiversity's co-director says human activity is pushing seabird colonies further and further away from their breeding sites. Our tour is back at the office preparing samples to send to the University of Barcelona for processing, where researchers are discovering new insights by crunching the data he's collected. The team hopes its findings will lay the groundwork for saving the red-billed tropic bird, and that by understanding their fragile ecosystem, we'll better understand the health of our own worlds. 
Wow, how beautiful. Hope you enjoyed the show and we'll tune in next week for another episode of Echo Africa. Time to say goodbye from Ogun State in Nigeria. And it is a goodbye from me too here in Kampala, Uganda. Don't forget to write or send us your comments on all our social media platforms. Remember, we're always open to your suggestions. Take care and see you next week with a new exciting episode of Eco Africa.